<laughs> okay. Oh, my God, if you only knew what was going on in the studio right now. I'm coming to you live from a Kodak Instamatic camera at the moment because um, nothing seems to be... Chords don't work. I don't know. Regardless, we're going to try this. We're going to see if it works. There will be no graphics today because I'm using Mark's computer to actually now broadcast as opposed to, you know, like actual cameras and studio and stuff. So now I get to like put my hands like super close to the camera, which I'd never otherwise be able to do. And we will see how this goes. No graphics. We're going old school here. And I have to look off to the left to my computer to like see the questions. Okay. We'll try this. Anyway, as people sort of join it, Mark is hovering here too, and I don't know what's going on. So it's like, as, uh, as we, uh, oh my God, that just threw me. Okay. So anyway, so it's like, yes, check out as we get, wait for people to arrive. I just want to do the housekeeping stuff. You know, as always, patreon.com slash healthcare triage, hctmerch.com. You could get that mug right there. And if you, I think we used to be able to offer that pill right there. Um, but uh, but you can certainly get the poster and everything else. Uh, and, you know, also Facebook.com slash healthcare triage. And now I'm going to assume that everybody who really matters is here. So we're going to go. Question number one, Chris Johnson. Chris, Chris Johnson. Chris Johnson says, hi, Dr. Carroll. What does the scientific evidence say about the effectiveness of acupuncture? Wikipedia says, and we all know Wikipedia is always right. Systematic reviews found little evidence of acupuncture's effectiveness in treating pain. All right. The problem with uh, acupuncture is that there, there have been some good randomized controlled trials. These have even been collected in systematic reviews and meta-analyses. The, but they're on very, very specific uses. Um, and so pain happens to be one of the ones that's been well studied. And what they found, and we also can do actually good randomized controlled trials, placebo-controlled blinded, where they actually like you know stick the needle in the correct spot in the in the in the intervention groups and then stick needles in the control spots or you know in other spots for the control group and actually test not only is it the needle sticking in but in the certain places does it work and what they found was that in a very recent systematic review and meta-analysis that it appeared that for pain control acupuncture actually worked um, and that it reduced pain more than placebo did now, some scientists argue that the effect sizes weren't huge. Others will argue that you know, even then it's not totally clear. But the bottom line is that it's like we have passed the, the threshold at which point my eyes will stop rolling when people talk about using acupuncture for pain control. Um, there, are some decent, uh, there are some decent randomized control trials that do show for pain control, acupuncture is not a crazy thing to do. The problem is that people take that to mean acupuncture works for everything. And then we can start doing all kinds of things and say acupuncture works. That it can control asthma, that it can control allergies, that it can control other issues that are going on. And for most of those issues, no, not much evidence at all. Um, and the evidence that does exist is not good in the sense that it's not randomized controlled trials. It is not controlled. And acupuncture is one of those things which is absolutely going to have bias within it if we don't do the proper studies to control for that. So... Pain control, not so bad. Decent evidence. Everything else, not really, not so much. Emily Liu, I've been on a few rounds of steroids trying to clear up a UC flare. I've been there. Uh, at first, we were trying corticosteroids, but now my doctor has me on glucoco glucocorticosteroids. What's the difference? Not much. Um, some of the different steroids are just strength, <clears throat> uh, just different potency. Uh, and so we, we even when we use them for like... Uh, um, oh my God, I'm seeing like these Slack conversations in the corner and oh. something is going crazy. Um, so it's, uh, so we use different formulations of steroids even on the skin when we control eczema and things like that because sometimes you need a stronger steroid and sometimes you don't and you want to tailor it to the person. So I would assume that they're trying steroids in you in different potencies and different types because of the difficulty in getting ahead of your flares. I sympathize. I've been there. Being on steroids for flares sucks. Being in steroids in general sometimes sucks. Um, flares sucks. UC can suck. I sympathize all the way around. Brandon Boswell says, is it true that consuming soy milk will increase estrogen level and ne negatively affect health? I drink soy milk and people always tell me I should switch to the other milk substitutes like almond milk. Now, 
I don't think there's any conclusive or good evidence that says that soy milk and estrogens are a real problem. This is one of those things that like is really popular on some of the you know out there food sites um, that'll talk about toxins and all this other stuff. First of all, why are you drinking that much soy milk that you could even be getting estrogens that could possibly do it? There's no reason to drink milk. It's the milk emperor. You don't need the milk. You don't. I don't understand why if you can't have milk, you need that much soy milk. I mean, is it because you're you need it in cereal? That I'll buy. Do you want a little bit in your coffee? So be it. But it shouldn't be in an amount that like you should be concerned that you're consuming estrogen in an amount that'll affect your health. Um, I mean, people take estrogen in doses that will prevent pregnancy and, wow, that was freaky, um, that will prevent pregnancy and will, and they're not like affecting their health. So it's like I, you know, no. I wouldn't avoid soy milk because of the estrogen issue, but in the same issue, why? why? That's not milk. It's not. Milk is produced by mammals. And almond milk, it's not milk. Coconut milk, it's not milk. None of it's milk. I'm just fascinated because I never actually get to see myself while I'm doing this. And now I see myself while I'm doing this. And it's, it's freaking me out just a bit. Um, question three, four, four. Christina Lai, when should children begin seeing the dentist? Well, as soon as their eyes start working. You see what I did there? No, oh my God, I'm not, this is not good. Um, Every source lists a different age. Okay, when you should start visiting the dentist, we start talking it to people. We start talking to people about that at about a year age usually. Um, uh, and that's when also they used to start brushing their teeth. And you know you want to protect their teeth. And you can brush it even earlier, not using fluoride toothpaste. But you don't want to be giving them fluoride toothpaste when they're really small because they'll swallow it. And we don't want them to swallow it, but they're too little to control that. So you got to be careful with the fluoride toothpaste. But brushing is always a good idea. Um, and seeing the dentist, I think most recommendations would be about a year of age. I just wrote a piece in the New York Times on all the evidence behind all the dental stuff we do. You should go read it. We'll be doing an update, up, uh, upcoming healthcare triage episode on it if you don't feel like reading it. But if you want to go read it, it was in this week's paper. All right, Oscar Barda. Hello, I asked on Twitter, but I'll try my luck here. Why are an what are antioxidants and what are they for and why do we need them or don't? Okay, you need antioxidants in your body but your body does a pretty good job of providing the antioxidants you need. The antioxidants are what we call free radicals. And what happens in your body is sometimes different pro biochemical processes, they'll shoot off electrons. Um, and we don't want those electrons like bombarding into DNA or bombarding into other things that they could hurt. So we want sort of a wall, we want defense to suck up those things. They're sucking up the free radicals. That's what antioxidants do. They are there to like sort of protect you by sucking up the free radicals that we would otherwise care about um, and that could hurt us. Uh, the thing is, as I just said though, your body does a very good job of providing you the antioxidants you need. Um, many, many vitamins, many things you eat are technically antioxidants. All antioxidants are not the same. They don't all provide the same thing, but they are in there to protect your body. Um, all of the things that like, this is where like you saw a huge number of studies back in the day, they'd be like, now we've identified the antioxidants. If we give the mice the antioxidants, they'll live so long and now it'll be the same. But okay, so when we try that stuff out finally in humans, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It doesn't, I, you can look at me this way, you can look at me this way, it just doesn't work. Um, and so, you know, taking mega doses of antioxidants, as we've said before, just creates very expensive urine. That's all it does. Um, that the studies of high levels of antioxidants, it doesn't prevent cancer, doesn't make you live longer, doesn't do lots of other things, it just doesn't work. Now, of course, if you're deficient in one of these things, it'd be bad, but the vast, vast, vast majority of Americans are not. They are not deficient in these kinds of things, and over or mega dosing in them will not provide you with the like serious improvements in health that you are looking for. Dorothy, and now I've asked, I answered you, so if I missed that on Twitter, I apologize. Dorothy Menifee says, I've heard differing answers on how I should, often I should see a dermatologist. Is it different for people who are high risk for skin cancer? This is a great question. Um, so we don't have like a definitive response. I have to go see a dermatologist every year because my doctor tells me to and I try not to be my own doctor. But that's because I have ulcerative colitis and I am on a drug which potentially increases my risk theoretically for skin cancer. Therefore, my, derm my doctor sends me to the dermatologist. And when I go to the dermatologist, basically I sit there in my underwear while he sort of walks around me in like 360 degrees with a um, 
magnifying glass while someone stands on the other side of the room and types away. And he goes, area one is clear. Area two is clear. Area th-. And that, that's the whole visit. That's the whole visit. And it costs a fortune. I have no, I literally want a racket. Blows me away. And I'm sure now I'm going to get angry, tweet some dermatologists who tell me that they're doing important life-saving work. But I'm just, it, it's literally just like, it's amazing. Like you could, you totally, this is one where I'm like, why do I need to come? This could probably be done by telemedicine or something else. Um, no tests, no labs, no physical exam. No one touches me. It, it just, it's just going around with the magnifying glass. But, but my doctor says I need it and I'm going to go because I try not to be my own doctor. Does everyone need to do that? I would bet no, unless they're at high risk. Because I didn't do it before I was at high risk. Um, there's a side benefit though. Every time my wife tells me she's nervous about the sun and everything else, and she goes, have you been to the dermatologist? I go, yes, I have. She has not, which shows you the double standard that sometimes occurs in the, occurs in the Carroll household. Now I really hope she's not watching this or I'm going to get into trouble later. I feel like when the camera is this close and I'm doing it, I'm, I'm almost performing more loosely. I can't, mm, this will be an interesting test because it's very strange seeing myself here. Um, Jenna Van Sickle asks, well, I'm assuming Jenna's three-year-old has eczema that they're really struggling with. They have a wonderful allergist, and they did tons of allergy testing a year ago, which identified eggs and eliminating them has helped tremendously, but recently the eczema seems to be getting worse again. How do we know when it might be time to do more allergy testing? I don't want to put them through unnecessary testing. All right. There's an issue here. you got two things going on. One is allergies, and the other is eczema. And it's not necessary that the two things meet in the middle. Lots of people have allergies and no eczema. Lots of people have eczema and no allergies. I assume that your doctor and your allergist were thinking, maybe if we keep the allergies at bay, that will help keep the eczema at bay. But that's not necessarily always going to be true. People have lots of eczema without allergies. I get eczema, um, interestingly enough, when my ulcerative colitis is flaring. In fact, it used to be an early warning sign for me because I used to get it on my hands. And it's like when I noticed getting eczema patches on my hands, I'd start to get nervous that that meant that I was in the beginning of a flare, the midst of a flare, and I'd start to get nervous. And I noticed that since I've been much more tightly controlled on the latest drug that I take for the last, I don't know, six, seven years, I've had no eczema. Um, but that's not allergies. That's an autoimmune thing. And eczema is really an autoimmune thing. And not all allergies are necessarily an autoimmune thing. Allergies are a slightly different biochemical pathway that can overlap, but not necessarily not. So I don't know that you need more allergy testing. Um, you know, people have other triggers for what goes to eczema. I would maybe talk to your regular doctor about that, who might have a broader differential for what might be causing your eczema than the allergist. You also might consider a dermatologist because they specialize in the skin and rash and eczema, and they might have a differing opinion on how you might control it other than allergies. Uh, and so that's what I would recommend. And I never give out personal advice, and I'm not telling you how to treat your child's eczema, but I would say maybe broaden your differential to talk to a more generalist, like your primary care doc, or perhaps to a dermatologist who's gonna take a more holistic view about eczema as well. And here comes Jenna Van Sickle sneaking in with second question. Well done. Can you talk more about when you would recommend someone see a therapist? What sorts of indications? How to find a good one? What to say when scheduling an appointment? I have such a low bar for this that I'm probably atypical. When should you start seeing a therapist? If you're thinking about seeing a therapist. What's the downside? I never understand this. Other than like, you know, the cost, um, which... I'm not trying to, to, to brush away, but if you would, you know, you'd see a doctor, you'd never go with the cost. If you wouldn't do that, you shouldn't have this, you'd have the same thing for a therapist. Um, do you have an issue that's concerning you? Anxiety, depression, sadness, something else? And that's, that's really of concern that's impacting your life? Why not think about seeing a therapist? The worst case scenario is you see a therapist for one time and they say, you know what, you don't need a therapist. Um, what sorts of indications? Anything that has to do with mental health, you know, anything you feel you're not doing well. I even have a low threshold for children. Is your child anxious? Think about a therapist. Is your child, you know, have difficulty with others and like other kids and sort of barriers and boundaries? Think about seeing a therapist. Does your child get too anxious about school, feel too much pressure, not know how to deal? 
Why not see it there? I, I, it's, we low threshold in the Carroll House. No. Um, issues with family. Think about a therapist. Issues with work. Think about a therapist. Issues with friends. Why not? All of these things uh, are reasons that perhaps a therapist could help with, or therapy could help with. And we, I'm amazed every day at what my friends and acquaintances will run to the doctor for stuff that like. I'd be embarrassed to tell my parents about, let alone a doctor. But they will run to the doctor to make sure it's okay. But they will suffer through terrible issues uh, when it comes to mental health without seeking health. Because I don't know. I don't know if it's the stigma, the barrier, whatever it is. Uh, people seem to have a much higher threshold. I would lower it. I think in the same way that we do doctor visits even when nothing's wrong for preventive help, why don't we ever think about that for preventive med mental health? I, I don't get it. It's baffling to me. Christina Lai, what do you think are some key points of each presidential candidate's health care policies that we should pay attention to? Oh, my God. Okay, why not? Um, okay, so Donald Trump, as far as I can tell, wants to repeal Obamacare. And again, take this with a grain of salt because he could give a talk at any moment, which will negate everything I'm about to say. He wants to repeal Obamacare, and then he has on his website, if you go look at his page on healthcare, the usual role of things that have always been a sort of at play. Let insurance be sold across state lines, ignoring the fact that it already is, if they meet the state's regulations, and that uh, that won't solve anything, because how do, narrow networks only work at a local level. And so if you buy a plan in Indiana that includes local Indiana docs, because that's what private plans do, then every doc in your state will be out of network. So it doesn't work. But anyway, let's, let's say it. It sounds good in a sound bite. Um, he will often say that we should have more high deductible health care plans and that the law should allow that. Well, already does. He will say that um, I believe he wants to... Uh, he does want, I think, negotiate for cheaper drugs which is interesting. And I believe once that he tweeted out that he could save $300 billion a year by negotiating better for drugs, which was odd because I think we actually spend less than $300 billion a year on drugs, so that would effectively make drugs free, but I don't know. Um, in fact, you know what? I could, I could literally pull up his entire plan on Common and on it right now. Let me do that real fast. Trump health care plan. Here we go. Boom. Sorry, our, our, here we go. Health reform, Donald J. Trump for president. All right. Complete repeal Obamacare. We did that. Modify existing law that inhibits the sale of insurance across state lines. Did that. Allow individuals to fully deduct health insurance premiums from their tax returns. All right. That sounds great. Here's the problem. Deductions only work if you pay income tax. And since more than half Americans, half Americans or about half of Americans, don't pay income tax, they can't deduct anything. So this provides no benefit whatsoever for the poorer half of America who are the ones that most need help affording it. Moreover, because it's a deduction, the highest savings go to people who pay the most. So if I pay the top tax break, my deduction's worth a fortune. If you pay at a very low tax bracket, your deduction is worth much less. So this benefits rich people the most, and they're the ones who already have insurance. Allow individuals to use health savings accounts. We already do. Require price transparency from all health care providers. Now, I'm all for this one, um, but I don't know how you do it uh, because, because it's not that we don't have health care transparency or pricing. It's also that there are negotiated deals between um, each health care plan and tons of different providers. So you'd need books and books and books to know what price are they charging here or there. We don't have the same price for everyone. That's how the private system works here, unless we go to an all-payer system, like Maryland has, but that's very unpopular amongst Republicans, so I don't know how you get the trace transparency. Block grant Medicaid to states. I've talked about this before. Um, it's almost impossible to do because the way that those plans save money is by drastically curtailing Medicaid spending, and since most Medicaid spending goes to like old people who are also dual eligible, you can't really cut their health care, so you wind up cutting kids and pregnant moms who are relatively cheap, so it's, it's hard to do. Remove barriers to entry to the free market for drug providers that offer safe, reliable, cheaper products and do the negotiation, and that, and that we've addressed. All right, so you can see I'm not very pro Donald Trump health care reform, um, which shouldn't be surprising if you follow me at all on Twitter, uh, but, but there it is. Clinton, 
health care reform. I'm going to guess she's pretty much for keeping the Affordable Care Act going. Um, and it might be, let's see, Hel health, health, Hillary for America Health Care. Let's look at hers. She says, defend and expand the Affordable Care Act, which, again, I yeah, this is going to be hard because you're going to think I'm biased, but partially I'm biased because if this is the way we're going to reform health care, we should improve it. Bring down out-of-pocket costs like co-pays and deductibles. I'm fine with that in theory, but that will cost more money. Reduce the cost of prescription drugs. This is where I'm not sure how we're going to do it. Government intervention to this would be a real thorny issue with innovation. We could try some of the, the th schemes we talked about in this week's healthcare triage on Monday, which actually reward innovation in trying to bring healthcare systems down and uses the free market to do that. That I before that is not what Hillary necessarily has said. Fight for health insurance for the lowest income Americans in every state by incentivizing states to expand Medicaid. I'm for that again. You've heard me talk about the Medicaid expansion multiple times and how like it's a relatively cost effective way to expand coverage. It's cheap. Medicaid is cheap. This is probably a good plan, especially if this is the way we're going. Expand access to rural Americans who have difficult finding quality. Now this again, it's like that's a great platitude. It sounds great. How? That's where the rubber meets the road. Is it going to be super expensive? Is it going to hurt quality otherwise? How are we going to do it? I don't know. Defend access to reproductive health care. OK. I'm for that, too. A lot of these is like, I'm for it. But these are more what we should do rather than how we should do it. And double funding for community health centers and support the healthcare workforce. Again, who? fine. But that costs a lot of money. So a lot. So my issue with, with, I guess, Senator Clinton, or not Senator, what are we call her now? Secretary Clinton? Does he always go with the last one? Secretary, Secretary Clinton? Hillary Clinton? Clinton's health care proposal? Is that they're, they are more, less, they're less what you're going to do, and I can attack those as I can do with Donald Trump's, and more like, here are things I think would be great ideas that, again, I'm sort of for, but, but I, when we get to the trade-offs, everyone's going to lose their mind. If this will raise the spending, health care spending, people will lose their mind. If this will result in more regulations, people will lose their minds. Um, and, of course, it, it's, it's, it's the opposite of what, what Trump says he wants. She wants to expand and protect the Affordable Care Act. He wants to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. You've watched my videos. I think you're going to know that I tend to favor one more than the other. And it's not that I think the Affordable Care Act is the be-all and end-all of health care reform. I have come to accept that the United States seems to want to create a universal or as close to universal system as we can by building and expanding on the private insurance system that we have as much as possible. Should you want to do that, you're going the route of a Switzerland or a Germany, you're doing it through a private insurance market. That means the teeth of what they do. Switzerland has a rock hard individual mandate, not this wishy one that we have here. You want to do it that way, you need a better mandate. People are going to hate that. You want to do things through private insurance, accept no local networks, accept narrow networks. That's how they compete. We don't like that. So we always want dessert without the vegetables. Welcome to the United States of America. Next question. Uh, Raz Delic, what medical skill besides CPR would you wish the general public to master? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, and it's not necessarily CPR so much as it is like, you know, base, well, I guess it is. It's like basic life support. BLS saves lives. Um, we, we talk about sort of the Heimlich, but that, you know, we're actually, that's getting out of vogue, and I'm not sure how many lives that saves, so no. Um, BLS, yeah, that's so great. I guess, like, um, hmm, I don't know. I'd like people to learn public health about what to do. I wish people knew how to eat better. I wish people would be more physically active. Those would really improve things, but I don't know if those would save other people's lives, which is what I suspect you were asking. You know, the big thing that, that saves people is basic life support because that's, of course, what kills people. All right, how about driving safe more safely? Accidents are a huge problem in the United States. Human error is still the number one cause. Drive more safely. There you go. And let's go with our last question of the day. Hunter Paul, Dr. Carroll, I've got way too many bodybuilder friends who take protein shakes and high-protein diets. Are there any studies for or against the effect of high-protein intake on muscle development? So as with everything... If you're deficient, then bringing yourself up to speed makes you better. But consuming massive amounts of protein with the effect of like really bolstering your workout, it does a little bit, but not nearly as much as people think. Um, you know, it's the massive working out that builds those muscles. It's the entering into a 
uh, I'm going to get this backwards. Anabolic. Anabolic or catabolic? Catabolic is consumption, right? Anabolic. Anabolic. So you want to build, which often requires eating massive amounts of, of calories, not just protein. Um, that actually builds and then everything else. But, you know, again, why are people obsessed with having massive muscles? That's not how human beings are supposed to be. So you want to be the correct amount, but sort of pushing it in that direction is not natural. In the same way that, you know, running 100-mile races is not natural. And people start hurting their joints, and they can't run as much. And it hurts their knees, and it hurts their hips, because that's not what we're supposed to do. Um, and if my wife is listening, you know, daily method or whatever, that which is her thing, soul cycle. It's like, you don't have to do that to be in shape. You don't have to do that to be healthy. You can do far, far less like I do. You know, moderate level walking, lifting weights once in a while, the elliptical machine, these are all good. They're all great. They're, they're enough. They're enough. You don't need to, to do all that bodybuilding stuff. So damage, yeah, you'll get anecdotal reports and you'll get reports of people eating so much protein and it starts to hurt their kidneys. But you got to eat a lot of protein to get to that level. Um, but I would be like, why are you eating that much protein? You'd really be fine if you didn't. Uh, and so there's not a ton of like randomized controlled trials or really good research on that stuff. But, you know, they're the ones that do exist show that, yes, supplementing will make some changes, but it's not in the same way. It's, it's like if you start massively consuming protein, you will not look like a bodybuilder. That's not how it works. You have to do a ton of other things, most of which are well beyond what most people are willing to do. And so it does not work, and it's a massive waste of time and money. Thank you for tuning in for this special episode of Healthcare Triage Live, brought to you by Close Up Cameras. Um, next week, we will be doing this again. We're going we're gonna to have Healthcare Triage, and Healthcare Triage news will be related to Healthcare Triage. We're going to talk about EpiPens, which have been all over the news. And if you haven't read my article yet, we'll be covering it next week. Um, we're going to do Healthcare Triage Live next week as well. Thank you for tuning in if you can. Patreon.com slash Healthcare Triage. We really expect, you know, we really, okay, just totally freaked out because I just saw an email come to Mark from somebody that works with me. And so I just got totally distracted. Anyway, um, Patreon.com slash Healthcare Triage. Any support you can give us, we really do appreciate it. Uh, to hctmerch.com, check out the Facebook page, watch Healthcare Triage. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. It's this one. Mm -hmm. Thank you and goodbye.